So can you please tell me a little bit about how Delwood got started? Mm. That's a complicated question. Um, I will tell you that me and my father uh, had a construction business, and the simple answer would be that we came home in the afternoons and we were bored. Um, you know, I don't know why anybody would be bored in an area like this, but I found myself very bored. I had moved from Raleigh. Um, at some point, I don't know why, because I, I've, I've tried to think of a good reason why we would start building a putt-putt course in our backyard. The, the simplest, the smartest sounding explanation is that we were doing a lot of construction work in Greenville for people that were kind of artsy. They, we did really nice decks and some people asked about doing backyard waterfalls and ponds, decorative ponds. So we dug the pond and piled the dirt up for the putt-putt course, but it, in the beginning it was really not designed to be a putt-putt so much as we were building rock formations and just a landscaping project. Um, and then it kind of turned into a putt-putt course as we were working on it. Um, it wasn't designed to be open to the public, it was just really something for us to do ourselves, you know, I guess as, um, you know, you have to understand at that time, 1990-91, the Gulf War was getting ready to happen, you know, with Saddam Hussein, the first George Bush, and a lot of people thought we were building a bomb shelter out there, so, you know, work. there was a lot of talk about it, and we um, thought the publicity and everything that we were getting, and all the, the talk and everything, that we, we thought that if we opened this putt-putt course, you know, enough people would knew about it that we were going to get rich on putt-putt. Um, you know, we didn't really get rich on it, but, you know, it was, you know, it was a starting point. You know? um, and as, you know, that first year we opened in uh, the spring of 1992, we were really enjoying, you know, people coming out, playing putt-putts, you know, the compliments of how we were building things, and so we were building little buildings uh, outside in the woods there, and I had a high school band out of Windsor that asked, could they perform out here one night, and we built a little stage outside, um, and they came out and performed, and their, their name was Diversity, and that was the very first band that played out here. Um, we, you know, we were seasonal back then. We closed in October uh, for, the, for the winter. Um, when we reopened in 1993, we had decided that the live music was kind of a, a neat little thing on Saturday nights with the campfires and the atmosphere and everything. And we, um, at that point, decided we were going to get a beer license, um, which met with a lot of resistance from uh, the sheriff at that time. Um, but you know, we. You know, tried to give him the explanation of how Bush Gardens was built. Uh, you know, up in Virginia, you know, it's funded by beer and everything. And, you know, whether you agreed with it or not, it was a source of revenue. And so we we opened in '93 with a beer license um, and started stepping up the bands we were having, getting better bands. Um, in August 28th of '93, we had a band from Jamesville played out here called River Bend Band. Um, that was the first band that we had that was playing on what you would call, I guess, the nightclub circuit. You know, all your big nightclubs, you know, Greenville, Raleigh, you know, probably Goldsboro and everything. And we were, the biggest crowd we had had up to that point was probably 150 people, which was a lot of people for us. Um, we had about 700 that night. Um, so at the end of the night, when we were counting the money, we, we realized that we, you know, there was a source of revenue here that we hadn't fully realized yet, um, and that we needed maybe to go in that direction if we were ever going to do anything more, you know, if we were going to have the money to finance doing other things, and that was the way we needed to go. So that night, the decision was made to build this, build this big dance hall here, um, and the reason we built this dance hall was because the, the better bands that would bring in more people, um, you, when you hired them to play, you entered into a business agreement with them that you would pay them rain or shine. So needless to say, a thousand, twelve hundred dollar band, you know, if they don't play on Saturday night because it rains, then you can quickly lose a lot of money and, you know, and, and that's no, not good at all. <laughs> 
So this this building was built in uh, uh, 1994 uh, and opened in uh, the fall of '95. And uh, you know and that's when band you know we started bringing in a lot bigger bands and, and the crowds started getting bigger and you know we were having upwards of a thousand people sometimes on Saturday night. So at that point, it just became a, a, a rush to try to meet the demands of having that many people come out here, you know, add bathrooms. Um, we were still seasonal uh, in 94 when we opened this dance hall. Um, we had anticipated closing for the winter. Um, you know, this really wasn't designed to be a closed-in building. The sides were open. These windows here were actually open to the outside, and, you know, and it was just more of a shelter. Um, we decided we would stay open week to week that winter when we first opened this. And um, what we found out was that it was actually busier in the wintertime as, as it got colder. And the winter progressed, the crowds got bigger and bigger. So then we had a, a new problem, which was to get the building closed in and to get it heated. Um, and, and so we went through several years in the mid-90s where we were just trying to, to keep up with the demands of the crowds getting bigger and bigger. Um, the restaurant was designed in 1995. Um, I went to Martin Community College and talked to the small business person at that time and did a, a, what's called a business plan. You know, if you're going to go out and try to speculatively borrow money at a bank, you've got to have a business plan. But, of course, what you also have to have is, is money. You can't really borrow money without money. Um, you know, unless you've got a rich uncle that's willing to sign or something. And I didn't really have one of those. Um, so. We went to, you know, we prepared a big business plan where we were going to build swimming pools behind the facility here. Uh, we were going to build a big steakhouse and, and, and uh, you know, a lot of things. We went to the bank and, and we got denied. Uh, they, they would not loan us money to uh, build a swimming pool, but they told us if we would drop the swimming pool idea and scale back the restaurant idea to more of a, just a snack bar, um, that, that we, they would loan us a certain amount of money for that. So we obtained, I think it was a hundred and hundred thousand dollar loan which is you know for something like this is not a lot of money and now that's really not that much money at the time that was a tremendous amount of money when you don't really have money and you're working construction and you're trying to do this on the side and everything yeah it's a lot of money so um, you know we borrowed a hundred thousand dollars and we built that restaurant um, and when we opened it it had pool tables inside of it and video games and it was just a small area of seating and it was more of a snack bar type thing really to service the people that were coming to the dances. Um, they were, you know, we didn't anticipate letting people come in just to eat at that point. I was more interested in making the money that they were paying for the cover charge to come and see the bands, you know, and then sell them a two or three dollar hamburger on top of that, you know, and make a couple more dollars on it. You know, I had um, I had some neighbors that wanted to just come in and eat and didn't want to come to the band. I really didn't want to do that, but I let them do it anyway. And thank God, you know, I... I didn't listen to my gut instinct and I started letting people in the back door um, to eat because the back door soon became the front door. So what, what happened is, um, you know, over the course of the next 10 years, um, you know, the, there was a scramble then to enlarge the restaurant, enlarge the kitchen. Um, you know, I, I didn't know what I was doing as I was doing this. I did the best I could, but I didn't foresee a lot of the, the things that I foresee now, you know, as far as design in the kitchen, crowd control, um, you know, things like that. So I've had to learn everything kind of the hard way. Um, so I've knocked down walls, I've moved stuff, you know, continuously. But being open on the weekends kind of affords me the chance that Sunday night when we close, you know, I can come in Monday morning and completely tear everything all apart as long as I can get it put back together by the following weekend. So that was what we did for a number of years. Um, and what we found was that, um, you know, the live music business, which was really big in the 80s, the 90s, we got into it as, as it was kind of dying. You know, you had clubs like uh, the Attic and um, places in uh, Raleigh, you know, that were that had always brought in a couple thousand people on Saturday night, and we we kind of came in on the tail end of that. So as that that type of business was declining through the 90s, and the crowd started getting smaller, luckily for us, the uh, restaurant business replaced that. So as the live music business went down, the restaurant business went up. So you know, back uh, 
you know, seven or eight years ago, we made a decision to just go with food um, because I, I was having such a large wait time on Saturday night for people coming trying to eat in a restaurant. Uh, and then I would have this big part of the building sitting here with a band set up to play with people that may or may not come at 10 o'clock at night. You know, it was a waste of space, so we decided to just use this as a restaurant. Now, that being said, this year, and plus you have to add in secondary things, uh, when you do live music performances, you fall under uh, you know, licensing restrictions because you're playing copyrighted music, so you have to have music licenses, and then the state of North Carolina has entertainment taxes and, you know, and a whole host of other license fees that make it very cost prohibitive to do something like that. Um, you know, you can be a little hole in the wall place, you know, somewhere and probably hide for a while and nobody realizes you're there. But then after a while, you know, especially with the internet now, if you advertise that you're having a band, the music licensing agencies like BMI and ASCAP will find you very quickly and send you letters and explain to you that if you don't buy a license, um, you will be prosecuted and you cannot beat it in court. You know, and it's based on square footage, the number of people that could potentially come. So for a place like this, you know, you're running into fees that are several thousand dollars a year just just to be able to have a lot of music. So it was a business decision for us to quit doing it when we did back in 07. Um, you know, now, uh, BMI and ASCAP offer facilities like ours an event license, and I bought one last year for four shows a year. So it looks like going forward that we will have some live music, but it will probably be something on a quarterly basis, maybe once every three or four months, and we'll just do a big show and, uh, and not try to do that every weekend thing. Okay. What other type of events does Deadwood offer? Well, I have just taken out a loan to expand the business. Uh, I'm going to try to focus in, uh, some on some different types of things that we can do outside. I've had the um, what they call it, the old North State Drum and Fife Chorus, like uh, the reenactors that go to uh, Fort Branch and all, come out in the costumes and they do the old period music and everything like that. So I'm going to start doing more of that on Saturday night, and more gunfights and western stuff, and, you know, stuff like that. A lot of the things we had probably coincided with me having children. Um, my first, my daughter was born in 1999, and very quickly thereafter, once you have a kid, you start thinking about things that, that you need to do with your kids, and you start thinking about all the problems you have when you're trying to take your kids out to eat and everything. You're basically at the mercy of your children, and until you have children, you don't fully realize that. You know, it's not where you want to go anymore; it's where they want to go. So, you know, there was a big scramble. Uh, around that time, especially around um, you know the, the turn there, 2001, um, where I, I started looking at different ways to entertain children. You know, we were lucky enough to find a, a used train um, out of a park in New York that we were able to buy, um, and then we put in a small roller coaster, and then you know. Uh, a nice playground and, and you know and I stressed every time about stuff like that I spent about 40 grand on that playground and I, you know and I, I thought to myself how in the world am I ever going to recoup that kind of money you know on an expense like that but but basically you know my business kind of doubled when, when we did that you know so you know what we found was that um, you know when the kids get in the car and they're screaming in the back seat and, you know and you're talking about where do you want to go eat they're all screaming deadwood so so the parents can come out here and get a good steak and everything, and, uh, and the kids can, uh, you know, go enjoy the little activities, and you know, that's where we make our money on the little dollar we get off of it here and there, you know, off of video games and stuff. I see the same people in here um, for years. You know, and it's funny because I'm, I'm now I'm kind of like one of those elementary school teachers that starts calling, you know, the kids their parents' names and stuff, you know. You know, I've seen, you know, especially, you know, back in the mid-90s when we were mainly, I guess the, the best word would be nightclub that people would understand, you know. I mean, we had thousands of people that were coming out here on Saturday nights for these bands, and I saw people hook up, you know, and get married and have kids, and then... Ten years later, you know, or you know, their kids are out here, you know. So it's it's kind of funny to see see that, you know, um, to see people that met out here, and then all of a sudden they've got little babies, and they're bringing them out here, and you know, it's kind of kind of interesting dynamic. You know, it uh, it, it, it in the beginning it was um, it was the summer summertime, you know, and it, it died off in the fall. 
Um, and then, you know, we opened this, and then I saw the, the, the busiest times were actually February, March, you know, the coldest of the winter, you know, the biggest crowds were here, and then we opened the restaurant, and then it, it, it kind of changed back where it was kind of even all year long, um, you know, and, and then now, the last two or three years, it's, it's changed back again where um, it gets really busy in the spring, um, and through about the uh, end of October, you know, our busiest month is actually October right now, um, and I think that's mainly because of the Halloween stuff we do. So you have a Halloween event? Yeah, I have a big haunted train ride, you know, and then we do a little haunted house upstairs in the building here, but, um, you know, that's gotten to the point where um, crowd management is an issue, so this big remodel uh, renovation that we're currently doing, which will probably take a year or more. Um, you know, is an effort to try to address crowd control issues again, which is kind of funny, you know, I'm, I'm right back to that situation again, which is a good problem to have, but, you know, I need a new train station, and I need to open up the courtyard more, because in, in October, especially the last couple of weeks of the month, it's just a sea of people, you know, they're just everywhere, and it's it's crowded, you know, and I just need more room, so it's, um, and so we were approached by National Geographic to do an episode of Doomsday Preppers, which we decided to do, because it was a three-day shoot um, and it would allow us to see what was involved in doing a... And you already have your doomsday bunker built, well, so why right. not? Well, see that, that bunker was, at, is, at, was actually built to be a private dining room um, for groups of 20 to 25 and it's got a big open fireplace in there and a wood burning stove and everything so it was going to be one of those places where we were cooking, you know, period on fire in a fireplace you know, the atmosphere and everything. Plus it's part of a train ride, so it's gonna be a fort on a train ride. It just happened to be built out of concrete. So it played <laughs> into the notion of what they, you know, we, we worked with National Geographic uh, for a couple of months on a, on a script for it. Um, you know, it was gonna be, you know, kind of like a, I don't know if you've ever seen this Kevin Costner movie you know, where it's the post-apocalypse thing, everybody's on horseback, you know, and everything. So we agreed to go along with this, this, this theory, you know, that, that electronics wouldn't work anymore and everybody would be on horseback and we'd be back to square one. And so um, and, and so they developed the script and we had a shooting schedule and they came out and, you, and these things are highly production oriented. I mean, you're, you're talking about for a 20 minute segment on television, they shot 17 hours of footage. Um, so, you know, every scene that was in that was shot 25 times, there's a man beside the camera, you know, that you're looking into, and he'll, he, they tell you exactly what to say, and then, you know, when you get to this point in the sentence, I want you to pause, count the three in your head, you know, then continue, you know, it's it's directed and, and scripted, and it was, it was fun, um, you know, it was weird. I